Welcome back to another episode of Psycho Cinematic. Today we are comparing the book Rosemary's Baby written by Ira Levin with the movie Rosemary's Baby directed by Roman Polanski. And as always, spoilers ahead. So much like my last episode when I covered Psycho, the book and the movie are very similar. You really only get a few more details in the book than you do in the movie, but I noticed when I watched the movie, there were things in there that were displayed on screen that I didn't interpret in the book, but added a little bit of flavor to it. So I'm gonna kinda go in chronological order and compare and contrast the book and the movie, as well as some other things that stuck out to me. So first of all, in the movie, when they are touring the apartment building, that's the fastest home tour I've ever seen. When I was reading the book, I didn't realize that it was that fast. I don't know if that was Roman Polanski just trying to hype it up a little bit, but it's kind of shot like a one take. I think there's a total of two cuts in there. It's kind of intense as if the person showing off the apartment is trying to get them to sell it quick and not notice any of the creepy things involved with this building. So this apartment is now open because Miss Gardenia died from a coma, which turns out to be a kind of common theme as we see with Hutch later in this movie dying from the coma. And so you've got to think well, I guess Miss Gardenia was kind of standing in the way of these satanic witches. Miss Gardenia had a spice garden, funny her last name is Gardenia, and maybe that's why she died, because she knew that Tannis root was a fungus regarded as the devil's pepper. I don't know if I missed this in the book. I feel like there was a lot of things in the movie that I'm like, wow, maybe I missed this detail in the book. By the way, I'm listening to the book with like noise canceling headphones in my backyard. So there's a decent chance every now and then I'm missing a detail because I'm only listening. I'm not looking. So this is one detail I might have missed. The fact that Miss Gardenia had covered up the closet. She moved that piece of furniture in front of that closet that had the secret entrance to the Cassavettes. And she was probably trying to keep them out, which is giving me chills thinking about. Also, this apartment's in New York. So I imagine from reading the book that the inside was maybe a quarter the size that it was in the movie. This place is huge. It's nuts. I couldn't imagine how much that place would cost today. Another little detail that was in the movie that I'm not sure if it was really even in the book at all, but I'm glad that it was in the movie. And because I had already known what was happening, it makes more sense. But basically when Rosemary and Minnie are done doing the dishes and they go out into the living room where Roman and Guy are talking about supposedly other actors and whatnot, Guy looks shocked and in disbelief because this is probably the first moment where Roman is kind of filling him in like, I can help you get whatever part you want. My assumption is that he's putting the word out and that's why Guy wants to go back and hear these stories. Maybe he wants to know if Roman's legit because maybe they didn't get enough time to talk, but he looked kind of startled that Rosemary and Minnie came out so quick because if he's being told what the price is to get any role you want, of course he wouldn't want Rosemary to know. So after Rosemary gets drugged from the moose and Guy basically gets her into bed. He's like, oh no, we can have a baby another day. I was thinking in my head while reading the book, I was surprised that he said we can try later. And I could be wrong about this, but my guess was that at the time they didn't take having sex with your sleeping spouse as seriously as we do now. And that basically not having consent of your spouse is still rape. And then lo and behold, Guy does actually have her get raped by Satan. And though this situation was awful for Rosemary, I was very glad that in the book she had this internal dialogue and you see a little bit of it in the movie where she is battling in her head whether or not she feels this is okay and doesn't want to just accept the fact that Guy did this for, in her eyes, like the best intentions that you could to have a baby. So I was glad to see that this kind of conversation was at least in the zeitgeist at that point. On the night that Rosemary is raped, she's wearing red, not only symbolizing the danger that is about to occur, but also the passion and desire on satan's part on the witch's part on guy's part and then i guess on her part to have a baby as well like it, it kind of encapsulates all of this even though it did not happen at all how she wanted rather that she was hoping to naturally conceive that night and not be drugged and raped now in the book i will say that the whole rape scene seemed much quicker than in the movie and so that was kind of off-putting to me I, I was surprised at how long the scene was and how graphic and like racy it was I feel like especially for the time you know they're showing nipples they're showing butt and a woman being impregnated by Satan surrounded by a bunch of old naked people as well and by the way if you've seen Hereditary and by now you haven't been making connections being like holy crap 
this is like the OG hereditary. It totally is. I'm sure Ari Aster, that was probably one of his main influences. It is so similar. I think Ari Aster exemplified the perfect way of being inspired by something rather than copying something. When Rosemary starts losing weight because of her pregnancy, in the movie, they did a great job with the makeup. She actually looks thinner. And I didn't see anything in the IMDb trivia saying that she actually like took a break from filming to go and lose weight. I, I know they definitely made her look skinny in the face, but she even looks skinny in body. Anyway, it was a great job with the makeup. Now keep in mind that this book was published in 1967. So there are a few things about being pregnant that they did back then that we don't really do today. Some people still do these things and it's not great, but when they first announced that she's pregnant, they, they celebrate with having a glass of wine. And I think there are, you know, like, conflicting studies of whether or not you can have a glass or whatever a day. But then she says in the book how she needs to check with the doctor whether or not she can have cocktails. And then her buddy Hutch is just openly smoking a pipe right next to her. And it's just like, she's pregnant. Stop with that secondhand smoke stuff. And then also while we're on the topic of this book being old and the way they talked about things, they use the N word in this book every time they refer to the man who is the elevator driver. And I can't remember if the taxi driver in the book is also black, but they, they, they use it pretty frequently in there. And then also in the end, if you, if you watch the movie, but you haven't read the book, there's the Japanese guy with the camera. They just call him the Japanese not the Japanese man, the Japanese. And I, I was thinking like in the book, maybe there's two of them, like, and you know, that it's like a plural thing, but no, they're just referring to one Japanese man as the Japanese. And then also this part in the book, Guy is explaining himself to Rosemary saying why he and that other actor swapped ties and he didn't tell her. He says he didn't tell her because he thought it sounded kind of faggy. So yeah, there's all that. So before Hutch goes into the coma, he wants to talk to Rosemary. I don't think they covered this in the movie, but the reason that Hutch wanted to talk to Rosemary was because his daughter had the same obstetrician, Dr. Saperstein. And my guess was that she had a completely different experience, wasn't in pain 24 seven, which then provoked him to do a little bit of research, especially knowing about the Tannis root, then finding the book on the witches, all of them witches, and then deliver it to her. But of course, we know how that shook out for Hutch. In the book, I'm pretty sure Rosemary went to visit Hutch at least once in the hospital, but in the movie, she's just like, oh, Hutch didn't show up? Guess I'll see him at the funeral. Like, what the fuck? When Rosemary's consuming raw meat, I read on the IMDb trivia that she actually consumed raw liver for that, which, it's pretty gross. She was the liver queen before the liver king was even born. It's very interesting how the dialogue in the movie is almost identical to the dialogue in the book. They leave in a lot of great quotes, but some of them they took out. Like one of the, the good quotes was when Guy was saying how, you know, after he raped her, that it was fun in a necrophilia sort of way, which just shows how creepy he is. But one quote that I really wish they didn't take out was when she feels the baby kick for the first time, he is kind of put off by this because now it's real. Now you know that the son of Satan is in her belly and she says to him, it's nothing to be afraid of, it won't bite you. I'm like, I mean, come on, why, why would you take that out? And one quote that you get in the book just from like the narration is, the baby kicked like a demon. Something that was in the book, but I don't believe I caught this in the movie at all, is when Rosemary is trying to convince Guy that their neighbors are in fact witches, She's saying it doesn't matter if you believe because they do. So if that wasn't in there, they totally should have put that in there because that point drives home everything. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. It doesn't matter if you believe it. The fact that some people out there think they're casting spells and they want your baby, that's a threat. Something that doesn't really make sense about this whole story is I don't understand how Rosemary didn't suspect Dr. Saperstein earlier. Like you suspected everyone, including your husband. But here's why. What tips her off is when she doesn't smell like Tannis root anymore. And then Dr. Saperstein's receptionist says like, oh, I'm so glad that, you know, you kicked that. Hopefully you could get Dr. Saperstein to get rid of his aftershave too. That smells just like that. You already know Tannis root is the fungus 
referred to as the devil's pepper, but it's well known that he is telling many what kind of shakes to make you in the morning that include tannis root. Like, am I missing something? The phone booth scene is amazing, both in the movie and in the book, but for separate reasons. In the book, it's incredibly tense. You feel like she is about to be chased down because she goes to the phone booth that is closest to Dr. Saperstein's office, and she regrets it as soon as she goes in there. And the entire time, she's looking over her shoulder, but she's also trying to make sure no one takes the phone from her as she's waiting for the call back and she's just waiting, 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 all that. And it, it's just building. And the end of the chapter says how there is someone who is waiting outside the phone booth. And you're like, oh my God, who is it? But in the movie, it's not nearly as tense as that. It still has some tension, but... What is impressive is Mia Farrow, the actress who plays Rosemary, her performance, because that's all a one take during that phone booth scene. And the amount of dialogue that she has to remember and deliver perfectly, so great. I am always impressed when a one take can be nailed successfully and it doesn't feel like they're wasting your time just because they want to keep it a one take. I'm getting chills right now before I even say it. When Rosemary is running away from Saperstein and Guy and she's hiding in her apartment, Oh, fuck. The, the two older gentlemen who are like sauntering from across the doorway, you know, sneaking around, they do it so whimsically, like they are just having the best time stealthing in her house. And I'm just like, fuck, man, that is so creepy. Oh, Jesus, I'm getting like cold sweats right now thinking about it. So later when Rosemary's baby is supposedly dead and she has to pump milk and she can hear a baby crying from somewhere and she's suspicious that that is her baby, she asks, what do you do with this breast milk? And they're like, oh, we just throw it away. And so then she decides to test it by putting a dirty spoon from like her coffee or tea into the breast milk to see what their reaction would be. In the book, that's super clear. In the movie, I felt like it didn't quite come across as, oh, this is a dirty used spoon and that's why she's putting it in there. So I feel like they could have delivered that a lot better even just by showing one shot of like a kind of dirty spoon from an empty coffee cup then going in. Like you, you kind of don't see it on screen. Now later when Rosemary grabs a knife and then she's gonna sneak through the closet, the imagery of the knife stopping that bassinet is just perfect. Now when Rosemary finally gets to see the baby, in the book they do confirm that he has his father's eyes like they said in the movie, but they are yellow with black slits. In the movie they just choose to show Satan's face again instead, which is probably better this way because it leaves you to imagine what a baby would look like with this stuff. But in the book, they're they're saying how the hands and feet are clawed, maybe hooved, it's got a tail, it has horns. It's like, ugh, that's disgusting. But Rosemary still talks herself into basically being like, I'm gonna be the child's mom. In the book they say this, in the movie they left it out, which I feel like maybe they shouldn't have. Maybe she should have talked to herself in the movie uh, just out loud. In the book she says, after all, this baby's only half devil and then half me, something like that. And then the book, she definitively says, this kid's name is Andy, it's not Adrian, it's Andrew John Woodhouse. And Roman's kind of fighting with her on that. And then Minnie chimes in saying, hail Andrew, hail Rosemary. And you know, like they, they start chanting again, which is super fucking creepy. And again, if this does not ring any bells for hereditary, when all the old naked people are gathered around, Hailing payment? Fuck. Here's a really cool kind of hidden detail in the movie. They touch on it a little bit in the book, but basically the baby's due date was June 28th, 1966. It was actually born on June 25th, 1966. They say in the book that that's exactly six months before you know whose birthday, Jesus's birthday. But something I didn't pick up on until I was looking at the IMDb trivia is that June 1966, the month is six, of 66. And here's the other crazy thing. They wanted this little baby Satan to be a Christ-like figure come the new millennium. So when the year 2000 came, he would be about Jesus's age, about 33 when he was put on the cross. The author Ira Levin was doing some research. So I haven't done my joke moral of the story for these books, but I couldn't help but think of this one. The joke moral of the story is this is why you don't talk to your neighbors.
like just straight up, you don't know what you're getting. So a couple of the other things I want to mention before we close out this episode is the infamous pixie cut. Mia Farrow made this haircut so famous, and it's apparently the most infamous haircut in cinema. So there's kind of mixed sources online, but she apparently cut her hair like this on her own two years prior. And when she has long hair in the movie, she's actually wearing a wig. And in the book, she gets her hair cut by Vidal Sassoon or... I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but they actually flew in this person to cut her hair in real life, kind of as like a publicity stunt, I believe. And I believe it's, they said it cost $5,000 for her to get her hair cut like that. And her hair is already like that. So they're just kind of like trimming things up. But I guess Mia Farrow was with Frank Sinatra at the time and really hated the haircut much like Guy did. Here's something crazy too about Guy, the actor who plays him, his name is John Cassavetes. That's super close to Castavet. What are the odds? All right, now I've been saving the best for last. I was thinking about this since this little satanic baby is named Andrew and she's calling it Andy. Here's my fun fan theory that actually doesn't check out just because of the timeline, but holy shit, if it lined up perfectly with the timeline, this would be nuts. Andy is Andy from Toy Story. Just think about it. Rosemary decides to get out of the city and go to the suburbs. Andy's mom looks a lot like Rosemary. She decides to have another kid, but for real, there's no Andy's dad in the picture, at least in the first three, I haven't seen past that. So she leaves Guy. She's out there in the suburbs and because Andy is a little demented kid, he's kind of got all these like spirits and energy and power around him that are possessing these dolls. And every time he leaves, they start hanging out and moving around and being really fucking creepy. Here's the funny thing though, if that were true, would that make Sid a good kid? Like he's trying to kill these toys that are in itself demonic. Like these toys like Woody and Buzz, they could easily be turning into like Annabelle's and shit. So maybe Sid is actually the good guy here. The only thing that doesn't check out is that Andy is supposed to be six years old. And when you look at Andy's mom's license plate, she has tags that say 95. So that would put him at 89 instead of 66. But fuck, how cool would that have been? Anyway, that's all I have for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed this episode on Rosemary's Baby. I know I did. The movie and the book were both great. Couldn't recommend them enough. And I feel like they clearly inspired one of the best horror movies of the current generation, which is Hereditary. So as always, if you have any book to movie recommendations, please leave them down in the comments below, and then I'll see you in the next one.